of Ephesians again, and uh, we'll continue in our series on spiritual warfare, and I aim to bring this to an end this morning, uh, the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, uh, the book of Ephesians and the sixth chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, we'll read. And like I said, I aim to finish this this morning. Uh, however, in putting, it, put the, putting the sermon teaching out this morning, there is a lot to cover. And um, as one of our brothers has rightly said to me this morning, by way of encouragement, that we do dig really deep in our sermons. And I do not want to not dig deep this morning. So I believe in digging deep this morning that you will truly... Be blessed with God's word. So here is the reading of God's word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning. Ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 10. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, gird up the full armor of God. Therefore, sorry, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the, the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. This is the reading of God's word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning and the church said, Amen. Amen. And so I want to conclude on the matter of our spiritual warfare. I want to conclude on the matter of spiritual warfare. I will not take time to recap this morning because that will take us um, a, a, a lot of time. And I do encourage you to look at the previous sermons on the matter of spiritual warfare. We last week ended on the matter of the belt of truth, and uh, the, we had a good Bible study on that, on the, uh, the belt of truth, and we were greatly encouraged, I was greatly encouraged with those who attended who were able to uh, articulate their understanding of what this means, the belt of truth. This morning we'll focus on verse 14, and it says, stand therefore having girded your loins with truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. Now you have heard this many times being said in prayers and in sermons and teachings and maybe in song even. Do we understand what this really means, the breastplate of righteousness in verse 14? Now the idea is already put forward into our imagination as to what it is. It is a breastplate. Breast meaning the torso a plate meaning something that is heavy. And so the, the breastplate was usually a tough uh, um, outer garment, a, a, a protective material, a protective device, um, normally made out of leather or heavy material. Sometimes even with slices of animal horns uh, put into the breastplate. And all of this was to cover the torso of the Roman soldier. Remember Paul is drawing illustration to a Roman soldier. And it is to cover the soldier's torso fully. That means from his uh, shoulders all the way down to, the, to his waist. It is to cover his torso completely. Uh, protecting all the vital organs uh, within the chest and the abdomen. Now there's a reason for that. In our previous teaching some time ago, many years ago, I made mention... Uh, that in the time of writing this letter, Paul um, was speaking of, of the heart and the bowels, that which is within the chest cavity and that which is within the abdominal cavity, the heart and the bowels, the bowels, the, the large and small intestines. And so the heart was considered the place 
where the, where the decisions was made, and this is, again, appealing to the context of the time. Paul was appealing to the context of the time. You need to protect the heart because the heart was the place where decisions were made, and you need to, need to protect the bowels, the abdomen, because the bowels was the seat of our emotions. So Paul is saying, put a breastplate over the heart, which is where the decisions come from. So don't make ungodly decisions. Protect the heart. And then also protect the bowels, the place of our emotions. And so Satan always tries to attack us in our decisions. And he tries to attack us in our emotions. Correct? So Paul is saying protect the heart. The heart is the place uh, where our, our decisions... Now, now, we know that's not the true today, right? We know that our, uh, that's, the, 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 our decisions are not made from f our physical heart. But Paul is appealing here in the sense of how our decisions are made and where our emotions come from. And he's saying, protect the heart and the bowels, protect the entire torso, uh, so that you will understand that Satan tries to attack our decisions and he tries to attack our emotions. By attacking our decisions, he leads us into ungodliness um, by making ungodly decisions. And he attacks our emotions by leading us down the path of discouragement. Discouragement is an emotion. I just shared that with you before I began my sermon. And it leads to depression and despondency. And so Satan says, protect your, uh, your emotions. Protect your emotions uh, with the breastplate of righteousness. So we are, to protect our, we are to protect our heart and we are to protect our emotions. But what is the righteousness here that Paul speaks of? And how are we to apply this righteousness on the matter of our heart and our emotions? Because the text rightly says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we know what we need to protect, which is the, the heart and uh, the, the, the torso, our, our decisions and our emotions. But how are we to protect it with righteousness? Well, we, we know that uh, Paul is not talking about self-righteousness. Although many believers try to protect themselves with self-righteousness, thinking that, uh, that uh, their own character or their own behavior or their own accomplishments will protect them from the schemes and the methods of the devil. We know that doesn't work. Self-righteousness doesn't protect us from the schemes of Satan. Let it also be known this morning as we try to understand what this righteousness is, is that this is, not our, this is not the imputed righteousness in salvation. So number one, it's not self-righteousness. And number two, it's not imputed righteousness. I wonder whether you can immediately call to mind what imputed righteousness means in the matter of our salvation. Well, Christ imputed righteousness to us where Jesus took our unrighteousness and gave us his righteousness. Imputed righteousness is important because when you pray, Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, when you pray, you're only allowed into God's presence because of Christ's imputed righteousness to you. God will not hear you on your own righteousness. You are not allowed in the presence of God with your own righteousness. But because Christ took your, righteous, your unrighteousness and imputed to you his righteousness. God hears you and recognizes not who you are, but he recognizes Christ's righteousness in you. And that's how he will enter into his throne of grace. And so you find Paul, um, uh, he's speaking here not about uh, self-righteousness. He's not speaking about imputed righteousness. What he is speaking about then is a practical righteousness. So when he says put on the, bless, the breastplate of righteousness, he's not speaking about self-righteousness. He's not speaking about imputed righteousness. He's speaking about a practical righteousness. But what does that mean? What does that mean, practical righteousness? Well, a practical righteousness we have to put on uh, is a life lived in obedience to God. So what does it mean, life lived in obedience to God? It means a life lived in practical uh, application of God's word. In other words, you can see in my life God's word being active in every decision I make, in all the things that I do, that I do it to the glory of God, I do it with, uh, uh, yeah, you know, for the glory of God, glorifying his name. 
understanding that my primary purpose on earth, the uh, Westminster Catechism, question number one, what is man's primary purpose? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so I find, my friends, as we speak, that Paul is talking about a practical righteousness. And if you just keep your bookmark on Ephesians chapter 4, I'll just give you three texts concerning this point. Go slightly to the left and go to Ephesians chapter 4. And if you look at verse 24 to verse 27, in the book of Ephesians uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse uh, 24, it says, and the, the text here from verse 17 has to do with the new man, the new, the new creation in Christ. So you are the new man, the new creation in Christ. And he tells us how to, how to walk and he says from verse 17, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you no longer walk as the, Gentiles, uh, as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the light of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. And he goes on to speak. And then in verse 24, he, we pick up the same thought, as the continuation of who, what the new man is compared to the old man. And the new man here in verse 24 says, And put on... Put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, and has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Therefore, and there's what we need to do here now. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. Can you see? You're laying aside falsehood, you're denying falsehood and lies, and you're speaking truth. Speaking truth is a practical righteousness. In other words, it's manifested practically. We hear it in the words that come out of our mouths. So, therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speaking truth, each one of you with his neighbor, uh, for we are members of one another. And so, he says, be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. So you find you see it's important. Be angry and do not sin. In other words, uh, you can be angry, but don't let angry, angry, uh, an angry mind, an angry attitude lead you to sin. And then he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. This is all practical. In other words, make amends. Say sorry, ask for forgiveness. Forgive before the day ends. These are practical things. And so there's, Paul is saying you need to have a practical righteousness. This, br this breastplate that we have on is a breastplate of practical righteousness, a righteousness lived out every day. Well, in Colossians chapter 3, uh, if you look at Colossians chapter 3, um, beginning at verse 9 in Colossians, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to Colossians and then to Philippians uh, just to give you as a, a preparation in Colossians, the third chapter, beginning at verse 9 to verse 14, he says, uh, Do not lie to one another. Again, we see here a practical application, a practical demonstration of righteousness. Do not lie to one another. Lying is words that come out of our mouth. Lying is not invisible things. It's words that come out of our mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, he says, listen to what he says there in the text, put on uh, tender mercies. He doesn't say think about it. He doesn't say learn about it and do nothing. What are we to do? We are to put it on. This is practical righteousness. Put it on. It says, put on tender mercies. Put on kindness. Put on humility. Meekness. Long-suffering. Put on bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. All these things that you are putting on is things that people see. And so there's a practical righteousness here. In Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12 to verse, verse 14, Paul says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. 
But I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Beloved in Christ, all of this is a practical, practical righteousness that Paul is speaking about. Now, reading this, you may think that Paul, when you think of... Uh, Practical righteousness, uh, you will think, well, Paul is, has no idea what righteousness is, or he has no comprehension of the righteousness imputed to him. But Paul knows all too well what imputed righteousness is. He knows all too well how he's justified to be in the presence of God. He knows that he's saved from hell, he's saved from the curse of sin and death through the righteousness that Jesus imputed into his life. But in order to live what Christ has provided for him, in order to live what Christ has purchased for him, he needs to practically apply Christ. That is the point here, brethren. That is the point here, dear church. He needs to practically apply Christ. We know that Christ has, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. It becomes mere doctrine if it is not applied. It becomes mere head knowledge if it is not applied. He needs to practically apply Christ, practically apply righteousness to his life. And this is what it means. He must apply it every day of his life. He does that by obeying God's word. We practically apply righteousness to our life by obeying God's word. Did you get that point this morning? We're talking about spiritual warfare. So we put on the breastplate of righteousness is to live daily, moment by moment, in complete obedience to God. You may say it is impossible. I say no. A better way to say it is you, you may say it is difficult. I say yes. It is not impossible because if it is impossible, then God will be a liar. God tells us that we need to live moment by moment. That means every second of our life, even right now. Live in obedience to God. Is it hard to do? Yes. Is it impossible to do? No. Yes, it is hard to do. And yes, we get better at it. Yes, God helps us to get better at it. So we are to live moment by moment in complete obedience to our God. And when you live like that, brethren... When you live like that, dear church, in complete obedience to God, I am not afraid to say it. I will continue to say it, my friends. We can live and we must live in complete obedience to God. And when you live like that in complete obedience to God, moment by moment in obedience to God, it is called holy living. That's what it is, holy living. It is called holiness when you live moment by moment in obedience to God. When a believer does not practically apply righteousness to his life, the devil will draw him away into further disobedience of sin. A life that is in sin and disobedience is called what? The opposite of holy is unholy. The opposite of holy is unholy. But one of the signs of an unholy life is a lack of pure godly joy. Are people crying out for joy that they would find, they would looking for joy. Oh, there's, there's depression, there's despondency, there's no joy. Well, I say to you, my friends, this joy that you seek, if you want it in alcohol, go find it. If you want it in sexual relationships, go find it. If you want it in friends on social media, go find it. But it will not last. The joy that God speaks about, the godly joy, comes only from obedience to God. It is a fruit of the Spirit of God working in you. And so you find, my friends, when there is an unholy life, when you find there is an unholy life, there's a lack of joy. So if you find today, my friends, there is a lack of joy in your life, and I don't mean happiness, I mean joy, godly joy. If there's a lack of joy in your life, could it be, my friends, I ask you to consider this today, that you're living a life that is unholy. You're living a life in a disobedience to God. Or in some way, in somehow, there's disobedience to God in your life. 
And therefore, that disobedience is separating you from God in a way where God seems far away from you, like David says. Will you not hear me, God, when I cry out to you? God seems far away from him. Why? Because David is in sin. He's indulging in disobedience. So could it be, my friends, that if you're lacking joy in your life, if you're lacking that joy, it could be that you're in disobedience. And therefore, Paul says, remember, joy is an emotion, right? Joy is not just a, a thought or a philosophy. Joy is an emotion. And if you recall what I said at the beginning when I started this particular text on verse 14, you apply the, br the breastplate over your decisions and your emotions. So joy is an emotion. So if you want to protect the joy in your life, if you want to see that joy in your life, live practically in obedience to God. Let there be a practical righteousness. So apply the breastplate of righteousness. Apply practical righteousness to your life. Make godly decisions. Live in a godly way. Live according to God's word. Verse 15. Look at verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 15. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Again, we've heard this so many times. But do we know what it means? Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is going through your mind right now as you read this? Are you answering it already in your mind as you read it? Having shod your feet. Having shod my feet. Paul is talking to the church. So he's talking to you. So if you rephrase that, having shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does it mean? What does it mean to having shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Now we come down to, we remember we started with the tunic. Um, we went to the breastplate. Uh, we, oh, sorry, we, we, we started with the tunic and then the belt. We went to the, the, the breastplate and now we come to the feet. We saw what the soldier wore around his waist, his belt. We saw what the soldier wore around his, his torso, his chest and his bowels. Now we come to see what the soldier wears on his feet. Shoes. And today we have shoes for every occasion. We have formal shoes, informal shoes. We have church shoes and we have working shoes. We have walking shoes and hiking shoes. We have shoes for sport. And even within sport, there's different shoes. If you play tennis, there's clay court shoes and there's grass court shoes. If you play squash, there's a certain sole of the shoe that you need. So there's different shoes for different occasions. And we understand the importance of the shoe for the task. So too, a soldier who is on the front line of battle needs to have the correct shoes if he's going to be a soldier on the front line of battle. And failure then to have the correct shoes will leave the soldier with blisters and with sores and with bleeding feet. If he hasn't, doesn't have the correct shoes. And if he's going to bleed and have blisters and sores on his feet, he's not going to be effective as a soldier. So Paul is conveying to us that the believer is a soldier here. He's a soldier on the front line of battle. And in order for you, the soldier, to be effective on the front line of battle, you need to have the correct shoes. In this matter of spiritual warfare, you need to have the correct shoes. In order for him to having done all to stand, he must stand in the correct shoes. Now, I've said all that. What does it mean? What does it mean having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Let's begin firstly with the word preparation. Preparation is important. Preparation here in the Greek conveys the idea of readiness. I'm always ready. Always ready. General readiness of the soldier. You're always ready for the call. You're always attentive to how the Spirit of God wants to move upon your life. You're always attentive to the open doors that the Lord would give you to evangelize. There's a readiness there. Are you ready to preach the gospel? And I don't mean you standing in my place and preaching in town. I mean, are you ready to preach the gospel? Is there a readiness upon your life? Are you always ready to pray? Are you always ready to preach? 
What does it mean to preach? Well, to speak forth God's word, to speak the good news. You walk out on the street right now, you meet somebody, and God opens a door of opportunity through the conversation. Are you ready to speak the truth? And this is the readiness here. I was in the barber shop on um, Friday, and uh, uh, the, the, the man who owns the barber shop, it's a Turkish barber shop, and all Muslim men. And so I sat there to have a haircut, and the man started a conversation with me. I did not start a conversation with him. He started a conversation with me, normal barbershop chit-chat, asking me what I did for a living. How is your work? work he asked me. That's an open door. I'm not going to keep quiet. I recognize he's a Muslim. It's an open door. Did I go back to check my notes? Did I go back? And I was ready. And I just started speaking. I was ready. I preached the gospel to him. I spoke about his Islam. I asked him if he reads the Quran. He said, sometimes he reads the Quran, and other times he doesn't. And I said to him, okay, do you know there are over 31 Qurans? He stopped cutting my hair in shock. He said, really? I said, yes. He says, tell me more. And I started to tell him how there, are, there isn't one Quran, as you say. There are over 31 Qurans. And I began to speak about a grammatical thing in the Quran called a kirat, which is a dispute amongst Muslims that high, high scholarly Muslims do not, want to know, do not want other Muslims to know that there are these mistakes in the Quran. They're saying, shh, don't tell everybody about it. Keep quiet, because the people will doubt Islam then. So I started to talk to this man. The door was open. I was ready. Be ready. Be ready. And I spoke to him. And then he asks me the question, which is the truth? And I told him the truth. I said, this is the truth. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That prior to uh, uh, um, Muhammad, there was no historical evidence for Islam. And the man was absolutely enthralled by what I was saying to him. I was ready. My friends, are you ready to speak the gospel? You do not have to know all the information I have, but you have to have the information ready to preach the gospel. A readiness here, Paul says. And the readiness is, my friends, a preparation, uh, having your, your feet shod with the preparation, with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Now, what is the gospel of peace? What is the gospel of peace? Well, first we find that uh, well, there are two applications here. I will just bring two applications to you. Two applications of what this means, the gospel of peace. So having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. First uh, is, is what we understand concerning this peace. It is our peace, the peace of God and peace with God. So having shod your feet with the preparation, with the readiness of the peace with God and the peace of God. So as we stand in spiritual battle, as we face the enemy, we have a peace of God and peace with God. So when we are at war with Satan, we know that we are at peace with God. How are you at peace with God? Well, you want to do nothing that can disobey him. You want to not have sins that can separate you from him. You want to be able to say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, that there's nothing between you and I, that there is no war between you and I, Lord, because I have a spiritual war that I'm fighting with the enemy. I do not want to war with God. I want to be at peace with God. And how are you at peace with God? Well, you begin by being at peace with God by understanding that you're saved. Remember, you were a rebel of God. You were an enemy of God prior to salvation. But God has saved you and brought you to be a friend of God. That you are now once an enemy, but you are now seated at his table. You're once an enemy of God, but your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So there is a peace between you and God. And so Paul says, recognize and be ready Meaning, recognize that peace that is there between you and God. It's a peace of God and peace in God. And Paul makes this very clear in Philippians 4, 7. He says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's a peace we have with God. It's a peace we have in God. Amen. The gospel of peace. So in other words, in other words... 
be ready, have your feet shod in readiness with the gospel of peace. In other words, be ready when the, when the door of opportunity opens for you that you already know this peace, that you can speak of this peace. I have this peace with God, therefore I can speak of this peace with God. And because I have this peace of God, not only I can speak of it, but I want to speak of it. Are you with me right now? Am I going too fast for you? I have this peace with God that I can speak of it, but I, but I want to speak of it. In other words, a diligent effort on my part to speak of it that I have this peace, of, peace with God. What, what does that mean, that I want to diligently speak about it? It means this, that I want to proclaim the gospel of peace. So having your feet shot with the gospel of peace is number one. The first application is that I have peace with God and the peace of God. But having your feet shot with the gospel of peace also means that I want to speak of the peace of God. And I want to speak it to somebody who doesn't have the peace of God. This is the good news that we bring to people. The good news that there is peace. Remember from the time you were born, right now I was speaking to my, I was speaking to my grandson yesterday. As his eyes were open, Joshua, as I spoke to Ezra when he was born, when Ezra was born, I held him and I opened up the book of Ezra and I started reading the book of Ezra to him. When Joshua was born, I opened up the book of Joshua and started reading the book of Joshua to him. And I was speaking to Joshua yesterday and I said to him, there is sin in your heart and you will be constantly in rebellion against God. There will be no peace in your heart until you know Jesus Christ. That is the truth. As beautiful as that baby is, there will be no peace in his heart until he knows Jesus Christ. From the time we are born until we know Jesus Christ, there is no peace. There is only peace that we truly know peace with God. When the Prince of Peace comes into our life, then we know true peace. The world does not know peace as you know peace. When you rest your head on the pillow tonight, as a believer in Christ, you know that you have peace with God and the peace of God. It is not the peace of the world. It is not what the new prime minister will try and achieve for our United Kingdom. It is not what the leader of the free world will try and achieve for us. Their peace is passing. It is nothing. But there is a peace that we have, which is the peace of God in our hearts. Oh, what a great comfort that peace is. That we rest in God, knowing that we are His and He is our God. And so we find genuine peace in God. So Paul says, be ready, be prepared with that peace in the, so that we may speak that peace to others. And what he's actually doing, what he's actually doing concerning the matter of evangelism, telling people about that peace, is basing it on Isaiah chapter 52. In Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7, it says, how beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation. My friends, may you be recognized by the Lord as having good feet. May you be recognized as having beautiful feet. Maybe we need to develop another sermon. The church has ugly feet. <laughs> For many of us, it is ugly feet. Ugly feet indeed, we need to hide it. No manicure in the world, no pedicure in the world can... Is it pedicure for feet? No pedicure in the world can make these feet look good. Paint it with toe, toe polish or whatever, nail polish as much as you want. Put shoes on it, it'll be ugly feet. The church is filled with ugly feet. Why? Because the church is not preaching the gospel. But the Bible says in Isaiah 52 verse 7, How beautiful are the feet. How beautiful. Your crooked toes, your stubbed thing, and it's, your toes are not properly, your ankles are a bit skew, and you've you know, got callus under your, your heels of your... But the Lord says, how beautiful are your feet. How beautiful are the feet. Why? Why? Because you've just gone had it done at Boots or wherever else? No, because it's the gospel that it carries. You're going to take the gospel of peace to people. That's why your feet are beautiful. Amen. Then verse 16 says, Above all, take the shield of faith, which, is, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 
Now, to best understand this, I want you to imagine with me a shield. A Roman soldier used a shield, but he used different types of shields. Several kinds of shields, actually. The two most common types of shields, the two most common shields, was the one shield that was just round, maybe 30 or 60 centimeters, and he would ha have it on his, uh, on, his, on his arm, and it would just merely be around like that, and he would use it in that way. And the other shield is a full shield from top to bottom that would protect his entire body. Now, the light shield, or the round one, which was the small one, which, would be, would, like I said, would be strapped to his arm. And that would be used for hand-to-hand -hand combat, in a way. And the other shield would be about two and a half feet wide, and about four and a half feet high. It was designed to protect the entire body. And we know this because we know, you may ask me, how do we know that? <laughs> Pastor, were you back, where do you know did you, did you see way back there when Paul... No, 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 no. I just read the Greek. <laughs> I read the Greek, and it's a, word called, a Greek word called thurios, and that word tells us the type of shield it was. It was a shield that covered the entire body. It wasn't the round, small shield. It was a thurios, the, the, the big shield that covered the entire body. So for the Christian, this shield, this thurios, this big shield, covers his entire body, his entire life. And Paul says that this shield is faith. What does he say? He says, take the shield of faith. So this shield that covers from top to bottom, this huge shield, is faith. Now when he says it is the shield of faith, he's not speaking of the matter of the, for example, I am a defender of the faith. Defender of the faith, like the queen is the defender of the faith, the, the, the defender of the faith is a defender of a set of beliefs and doctrines. So Paul is not saying your shield is a set of doctrines and beliefs. No. Paul is saying when he says put on or take the shield of faith, he's saying take the shield of our basic trust in God. This shield is our basic trust in God. Your basic trust in God. I believe God. I believe God. I have a basic trust in God. When the Christian stands behind this, he's standing behind his basic trust in God. When he's standing behind this shield, he's standing behind his basic trust in God. What does he believe? His basic trust in God. He believes that God is the author of his salvation. And God continues to bring him blessings and daily provision and strength. And we can go on as listing the things that we basically trust God in. The basic substance of our Christianity is faith. Amen. And what is this faith already? That God exists. We know that God is real. That is our basic faith. We believe that God rewards those who diligently seek Him. Our faith is that He said He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on an old rugged cross. And on that cross, He took our sins. He took our unrighteousness. That on that cross, He gave us His righteousness and the forgiveness of sins. That He died. And He said, before He died, He said, it is finished. And they laid Him in a tomb. And on the third day, He rose again from the dead, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And He ascended to the Father, and He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And we know that He's coming back again for His bride, for His elect, for His believing ones. This is our basic faith. Our basic trust in the Lord. So Paul says, stand behind that basic trust. Stand behind that faith. That is your shield that protects you. So every person, believer or not, lives with some form of faith. Well, the unbeliever doesn't like to think that he has faith, but he has faith. He has faith in his unbelief. We have faith in God. The unbeliever says, I have no faith. He says to you, I have no God. Well, you need to correct him. Remember, I said, be prepared. Have your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Be prepared. How are you prepared? Well, when he says he has no God, you say, well, you have a God because you are your own God. Life begins and ends with you. True. You say, yes, 
I am my God. I am the author of my destiny. I am the wind in my sails. I decide where I go. I decide when I die. I am my own God. Say, so, so you have a God. <laughs> it is you. <laughs> oh, I have no faith. Oh, you have? No, you have faith. Let me tell you, you do. What do you mean I have faith? Yes, you have faith in yourself only. You don't trust God. You trust yourself. And we can go on and on. And so there, every, every person has a faith. Even unbelievers have a faith. They have a God. They trust themselves. When we, walk, when we walk across a bridge, we have faith that the bridge will hold us up. Believers and unbelievers have the faith that the believers, that the, the bridge will hold them up. When we board a plane, we have faith in the pilot that he's been well trained. Then when he says, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to take off, you sit back, you relax, put your seatbelt on, and you think, okay, this man, I, got, I trust him, he's going he's to give me a good flight. We're going to land safely at the destination. We have faith in the man. We have faith in those things, my friends. Faith in the bridge, faith in the man who flies the plane. Yet those things fail. They're fallible. They fail. They break. They can break down at any time. As was the man who flew the plane into that mountain in Germany. Why? Because he was depressed. People had faith in him. The folks who boarded that plane had faith in him. But what did the pilot do? He locked the door and he flew that plane straight into a mountain. Why? Because he was depressed in his own life. He took people with him and killed them. So it's fallible. He can break down. They can fail. Paul says that we stand secure in our battle with the shield of faith. And our faith is in God and not in man. It is in God who is infallible, who is immovable, who is unshakable. He is the solid ground on which we stand. He is our steady anchor in the storm. He is secure and he is supreme. He's the God of heaven and earth. He was God before, he's God now, he's God in the future. There is none like him. Amen. He will never, nobody and nothing can take him off his throne. He's the king of glory. He's the Lord God Almighty. So the protection over our entire body, our entire life, is that faith in who, in who God is. It's our basic trust in God. And then Paul says, concerning this faith, that this faith that we stand behind, this shield, has a purpose. What will it do? This basic trust you have in God will do something. What will it do? It will quench the fiery darts. It will quench the fiery arrows. It will quench the missiles of the wicked one. This is the military strategy that Paul puts in place here. Remember, the military strategy of, of Paul's time is very similar to the mil military strategy of our time. Except he, they used arrows. We now use ammunition and bombs. In Paul's time, the weapons were made to do the most amount of damage. So in Paul's time, they would, they would, they would, they would pull the arrow back, and put it into the bow, and they'd pull the arrow back, and they'd fire it in a certain way to achieve a certain height. And when it came down, velocity was on, the, on, their, on their side, and it would pierce straight into the person. And they would make the arrows certainly sharp with a certain type of material to pierce through the armor or pierce through whatever protection. But Paul goes a little further and says, listen, they're going to cause more damage. What's the more damage? They're not only going to make these arrows sharp, they're going to dip them in something that's flammable, set it alight and fire it, that when it comes upon you, it's not only going to pierce you, but it's going to totally destroy you. It's going to burn you up. So weapons were made for destruction. I will... <laughs> I will tell you the story, by the way, when I was an unbeliever, I, 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 had, used, to carry a, I used to carry a firearm. The first time I went into church, I, I, I carried a firearm with me to the church. I sat in the church with a gun strapped to my ankle because that's the type of person I was. If you think that's bad, inside of the firearm is a magazine. Inside of the magazine was bullets, but the first three bullets of that magazine was what we used to call hollow point bullets. Hollow point bullets meaning the front of it was cut off, that if it went into you, it would do the most damage. So there's weapons doing damage. So not just a bullet that will fire, but a bullet that will totally devastate you. I only speak of it, not to boast of it, but to speak of it in a sense of the, of 
the damage that weapons cause. We not just want to kill, we want to destroy, devastate life. And here Paul is saying that these weapons, these arrows are not just arrows to pierce, but arrows to cause massive devastation. And he says, this is what the devil does. He doesn't just want to pierce. He wants to cause massive destruction. It's sort of not, not only that he wants to fire an arrow at you, he wants to dip the arrow in fuel. He wants to set it alight that when it pierces you, it causes the massive destruction. He wants to destroy you completely, bring total devastation to your life, including your salvation. He wants to destroy your salvation. He wants to destroy your place in God. He wants to remove you from the Lamb's book of life. He wants to, he wants to destroy you from being a recipient of the blessings of, and favor of God. These flaming arrows could be anything, my dear friends, anything from temptation to doubt to unbelief to disobedience, whatever it is, flaming arrows. They're not just arrows, they're flaming arrows. This shield that Paul tells us is a shield that covers and protects the entire Christian life. So he says, stand behind your basic trust in God. And you will be protected from the fiery arrows, the fiery missiles of the enemy. What else do we see? Verse 17, the first part of verse 17. Verse 17a, and take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Well, the Roman soldier knows that he cannot enter a battle without his helmet. The helmet was made of heavy molded material and its purpose was to protect the head, correct? That's what you use the helmet for, to protect the head. And it is to protect the head from any injury, especially injury that came from what we call a broad sword. A broad sword would be a long sword that the soldier would swing at a distance to somebody and hoping to get as many people as he can. So if you can imagine with me, he would swing the sword and whoever's in front of him would either be de you know, decapitated or injured by the sword because he's bound to strike somebody. And that's what a broad sword would do. Damage or bring devastation to as many people as possible. So the broad sword was a weapon, a sword uh, uh, of choice in the day, a large sword. And it, it would even split the skull. That's how heavy and broad it was. And, how, and also, like you heard me say, bring, um, it would decapitate them. This was a large sword. So the helmet then was designed to protect the head. It was uh, designed to protect against the, the broad sword. But let's look at what Paul says concerning this helmet. This helmet is the helmet of salvation. The fact that the helmet is, relate, is related to salvation is an important point. It shows that, the, that, that Satan will try his best to come at you concerning your salvation. Satan's blows are directly related to your salvation. They're directly aimed at your salvation. They're aimed at your assurance and your belief and your security in God. Like the physical broadsword. The physical broadsword had two sides. The soldier could swing it this way, it'll work. If he swings it the other way, it'll work. It had two sides. Satan's broadsword has two sides. And the two sides are designed to do damage. And the two sides are called this, my dear friends. They're called discouragement and they're called doubt. Satan's broad sword is called discouragement and doubt. And whichever way he swings it, this way or that way, it brings discouragement and doubt. And I will not state it as a fact, but I will say it this way. First there is discouragement and then there is doubt. Discouragement leads to doubt. I said I will not say it as a fact because sometimes doubt may lead to discouragement. But most times we know that discouragement leads to doubt. And this is how Satan works. Satan discourages the believer. He takes a broad sword and he swipes. He discourages the believer. He brings up the believer's past mistakes. He brings up the believer's past mistakes. He brings up the believer's uh, past life. He reminds the believer, oh, you're going through this kind of sickness. Where is your God now? He reminds you, oh, listen, you don't have enough food in your home. Where is your God now? 
Or you're unable to study God's word. Look how poor you are at your English and your understanding of the language. And he brings all negative thoughts into your mind. Finally, you get so discouraged that you begin to doubt. And you begin to doubt in God. I have my fair share of this kind of attack every day of my life. Every day of my life, I have this fair share of this kind of attack. Satan attacks me with discouragement. When I see congregations, when I see the congregation's lack of interest in studying God's word, or lack of interest in praying together as a church, when our prayer meetings are hardly filled with anyone except those who are faithful every week, when people don't respond to Bible study, when, there is no, when the invitation to study God's word is just uh, met with all sorts of excuses, well, I get discouraged. And I get discouraged to the point of where I begin to doubt. And the doubts go something like this. Is it worth it? Is it worth trying to teach people? Is it worth trying to labor over my sermons for so long? Is it worth it trying to spend so many hours in the study trying to bring God's word? Very easily lead to doubt and then doubt leads to disobedience. And very soon from disobedience you lead to giving up. Giving up meaning, oh, I give up on that person now. I've tried my best. I, they're not listening. I give up on them. And very soon you find that the minister begins to give up on the entire church. We see the story in 1 Kings. You don't have to turn there. I'll just briefly summarize the story for you. In 1 Kings, in chapter 18 and chapter 19, we learn of the man of God called Elijah. Here is a great man of God. Many people speak of him in a way that's wonderful and powerful, which we must do. A great man of God, man used of God. He calls down fire from heaven to destroy uh, uh, the false prophets, to destroy their false worship. He mocks them in a sense of who they are as, as, as false worshipers of Baal. He's successful in the ministry. He calls down fire from God. He prays. And God provides rain upon the land. In fact, in James, we were asked to be like Elijah who prayed. And God provided rain. But here is the man of God whom God used to call down fire from heaven. In, in, in 1 Kings, he's now running for his life. Because Jezebel had formed a spiritual battle against him. The great man of God is now running for his life. He hides under a juniper tree and he says, Oh Lord, will you not take my life? He wants his life to be taken. Lord, will you kill me? Will you take my life? How does a man go from calling fire down from heaven to saying, God, take my life, please. I don't want to live anymore. Discouragement, despondency, disobedience. And finally, abandonment in the man of God. A true prophet of God who came under persecution and find that discouragement led to disobedience. So to protect us from this attack of the enemy, this discouragement that leads to disobedience and then finally abandonment, we had to put on the helmet of salvation, Paul tells us. But note, putting on the helmet of salvation is not receiving salvation, it's already having salvation. So when you put on the helmet of salvation, it doesn't mean you're putting on being saved because you are already saved. This is an armor for those who are already saved, not those who are going to be saved. And then the sword of the Spirit, we end with this. We end with this on verse 17. So having put on the helmet of salvation, and then Paul says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And on this verse we will close today. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the sword here, my dear friends, is the sword referring here in, in this particular context is not the broad sword that I spoke of a few minutes ago. The broad sword measured about 1.2 meters in length. But the sword that Paul speaks of here in the Greek is a smaller sword, only about 20 centimeters in length. This is a ruler length, right? Ruler length. About 20 centimeters in length. So the broad sword is 1.2 meters, 
But this sword in the Greek that Paul talks about is a smaller sword, only 20 centimeters. I found this quite intriguing. Why would we have such a big shield of faith and such a small sword? In fact, the pictures that you see of the armor of God are incorrect. Statues and sculptures that you see of the armor of God are incorrect. Because you see the person with the armor of God with a big sword. It's not a big sword. The Greek word tells us it's a sword only about 20 centimeters. I find that very intriguing. Why would Paul say we need to have such a small sword? I want to do big damage. How can I do it with a small sword? Well, it's important the damage that you do, uh, in the sense of damage, in the sense of the warfare, is used with the proper weapon. And Paul gives us the proper weapon. He tells us it's a sword only about 20 centimeters. Now, we know this sword is the word of God. The word of God can't be measured by centimeters and millimeters and meters and inches and feet. So what is Paul saying here? Well, we know, first of all, that the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, meaning that this sword is not a literal sword. It is a sword of the Spirit. It is the word of God. It has come from the Spirit of God. It finds its divine origin in the Spirit of God. And it, is a, it has a divine power, a divine potency from God. What then is the sword of the Spirit? Well, um, Paul tells us that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, or more accurately, the sword of the Spirit is Scripture. And Paul is letting us know the important part here of Scripture, the importance of Scripture, and, and the importance of Scripture in the sense of the believer's life. So I ask you the question this morning, how important is Scripture for you? Your answer should be, we, we, we cannot do without it. It has the highest place in our life. I cannot do without the Word of God. Famous Scottish preacher, a man by the name of Thomas Guthrie, who lived in the 1800s, said the following, and I quote, The Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of exhaustless wealth. It is a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a medicine for every malady, and a balm for every wound. Rob us of our Bible and the sky has lost its sun. In other words, if he's absent without his Bible, it, it, it's almost like the sun has disappeared from the day. The Bible, my dear friends, is without doubt inerrant, infallible, authoritative. It is faultless. It is flawless. It is without blemish. It is without mistake. The Bible is determinative, is an important word that we would use here, meaning that the believer who follows what the Bible says will see the fruit of what the Bible says you will see if you follow it. The Bible is also the source of our spiritual growth. Paul tells us it is milk for the new believer. It is solid food for the older believer. The Bible also tells us that the, the, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit. The Bible is the source of illumination. It is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. So we find that the Bible, this Holy Scripture, is the sword of the spirit. But Paul's description here of the sword, like I said, is not the broad sword, but the smaller sword. And the, the use of the word here is important. Now, the, 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 when, he says, when he says in verse 17 that, that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, the word, word there is not logos. Now, when we look at word in the Bible, there are two words that we use to describe the word word. The word of God is logos, and the word of God is rhema. Here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the rhema of God. It is not the logos of God. It is the rhema. What do we mean? Well, logos means the general scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The general scripture. The 
John chapter 1 talks about Jesus being the Logos. Here in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17, the word here is not Logos, which is the general scripture, but Rhema, which is specific scripture. Stick with me now. Specific scripture. It refers to individual passages. It refers to certain things that the Word of God says, specific things that the Word of God says. The Apostle is saying that though we have general knowledge of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, in our battle sometimes we need a specific uh, Scripture that's applicable. Are you with me right now? You need to have knowledge of an application of specific Scripture that's applicable for what you're facing. A rhema word. Or a rhema here. Not logos. So logos is the entirety of scripture. Rhema being that specific scripture. Let me help you understand how this works. And it will help you pray in your prayer. It will help you in your spiritual battle. No doubt. For this is what I am called to do. Is to equip you for the work of service. Uh, so go with me to the book of Matthew. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 4. Let's look at Jesus's. Um, temptation in the wilderness and you will see here how Jesus responds not by logos but by rhema so Ephesians uh, sorry Matthew chapter 4 uh, beginning at verse 1 and we'll read all the way to verse 10 beginning at verse 1 Matthew 4 then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and after he had fast, fasted 40 days and 40 nights he became hungry and the tempter came this is Satan and, and came to him and said to him and here's here's how it begins now right here's how it begins if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, what is, what, what is the context here? The context here is that Jesus is fasting. It means he's hungry. He has no food. He denies himself of food. What does Satan do? Satan comes and tempts him to turn stone into bread. It's specific. Satan's not tempting him to go buy a car. Satan's tempting him to turn stone into bread. Correct? He's specific. Now, Jesus responds specifically. He doesn't respond generally. He responds specifically. So Satan said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Why? To satisfy your hunger. Verse 4. But he answered, Jesus answered and said, it is written. God is sovereign. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. See, that's general. That's logos. But Jesus does not say that. Though it is true that God is sovereign. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus would be right in saying that because it is true. But Jesus does not respond with a logos. He responds with a rhema, a specific word. What does he say? But he answered and said to him, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Bam. Specific. See what he's, what he's done? He's answered specifically. And then Satan says, then the devil took him into a holy place and and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they shall bear you up, and you shall not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus answers here specifically again concerning this trying and testing of God. He says, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, he's applying a specific word to the attack. And in the third temptation, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. The demand here, the attack is worship. If you will just worship me, that's the, that's the attack. Fall down and worship me. Listen, now, listen to how Jesus responds. And Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Can you see how Jesus responds? Jesus responds about worship. He doesn't respond generally about things, but he responds about worship. In, the, in other words, he responds to the very attack that Satan brings his way. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, don't use a broad sword. Though you'd be right, nothing wrong in using a broad sword, nothing wrong in speaking generally about Scripture. Satan comes to Jesus and says, well, uh, command these stones to become bread. Jesus could have said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God created man in his image. In the book of Revelation, it says that he's coming once again for his bride, and Jesus would be right in saying that. Why? Because it is the entirety of Scripture. It is the Logos. 
But Jesus does not use the entirety of scripture. He uses specific scriptures. The rhema. When contending with the devil. And that's what Paul is saying here. The small sword that does the big damage. It is the small sword here. 20 centimeters that pierces straight into the problem. Why? Because he's providing the scriptures to attack the very problem. That Satan is bringing your way. So when Satan speaks to you about a, about a, about a man not being a man. You speak from the word of God about who a man is. When Satan speaks to you as a woman and not you not being the woman of God that you are called to be or attacks you concerning you being the woman, you can speak as a woman of God from Scripture. And so it goes on and on and on. My dear friends, it's interesting. We must conclude now. Time has quickly passed and we must conclude. I want to bring an end to this. I don't want you to go to another part four. So let's bring an end to this. The word of God, my dear friends, used in this way can be very offensive. Not only a defensive weapon, not only to defend, but an offensive weapon to strike forward. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, he says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of, of him to whom we must give an account. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, how wonderful it was to hear God's word this morning and over these last few weeks. The more we understand scripture, the more we will be able to stand against the schemes and the wiles of the enemy. Are you in sorrow? Learn God's word. Don't go to the doctor only. Don't go and ask for antidepressants. Learn God's word. I'm not speaking against medication. Learn God's word. Is there trouble in your life? Learn God's word. Is your road difficult? Learn God's word. Is there much war in your life? Learn God's word. My dear friend, learn God's word. The more we learn God's word, the more we will stand against the schemes and the wiles of the enemy. There is no believer here today, my friends. There is no excuse amongst the believers here today. And you say, well, we don't know God's word. We don't understand God's word. We have no opportunity to learn God's word. No, my friends, you have every opportunity. Even coming the beginning of September, I am introducing a new class to teach you God's word. I am not being discouraged by those who have not attended. I am not being discouraged by those who do not want to learn. I am still going to continue to teach God's word. For all those who would come, my friends, to learn God's word, because this is what you need. There is no excuse, my friends. As you stand before God on judgment day, you cannot say, I did not know, Lord. The church did not teach me. Pastor did not spend time telling me about this word and that word. I didn't know what that meant, Lord, and I don't know what that meant. My friends, you cannot plead ignorance on that day. Because you are blessed to be a part of a small church that teaches God's word on a weekly basis. Every Lord's Day, we teach God's word. My friends, the only thing that you will be accused of the only thing that you will be stand guilty of are two things as a Christian on the Lord's Day, on the, on, on, the, on the Day of Judgment. Do you know what those things are? They will be disinterest, disinterest and neglect. Those are the two things. The Lord will find you guilty if you're not studying God's word. The Lord will find you guilty of disinterest and neglect. Disinterest meaning I'm not interested in that word. I'm interested in other things. Netflix and this and that and whatever. I'm interested in those things. I'm not interested in studying God's word. And then there's neglect. Neglect meaning you know you're supposed to do it, but you just don't do it. I've neglected it. May the Lord find you not guilty. As you stand before God, may he not charge you with dis disinterest. May he not charge you with neglect as many will be charged on that day. I close with this, my dear friends. I close with this. When you come every Lord's Day, I remind you, I speak to you as a beautiful group of God's people. Beautiful in the sight of God. No matter who comes or does not come, I make it my purpose every week to bring you the word of God in power and strength, relying on the spirit to convict your hearts. And I say to you, my friends who are listening, may your attentiveness and your diligence and your dedication to God's word continue to grow. Do not let others who have come or have not come 
convince you that it is not important to study God's word. It is important. I'll give you this by way of example. A man called H.P. Barker who was a hymn writer, but he was also a very powerful preacher. And he described the church in this way. You're either a bee, a butterfly, or a botanist. You're either a bee, a butterfly, or a botanist. What does he mean by that? Well, he says, as he looked out into the garden one day, he saw three things. First, he saw a butterfly. It was beautiful, and he would settle on a flower and then flutter from one flower to another. It would settle only for a second. Second or two, then it's gone to the next flower. It would touch as many blossoms as it could, but it derived absolutely no benefit from it. Second, Mr. Barker said, and I saw a botanist. The botanist came with a notebook under his arm and a huge magnifying glass, and he would look at every flower and every leaf, and he would write in his notebook, through his magnifying glass, he would look, and he would lean over, and a certain flower would capture his attention, and he would look for a long time through his magnifying glass, and then he would make some notes in his notebook. He was there for hours and hours and hours writing notes in his notebook. He then stuck the notebook under his arm, put away his magnifying glass, and went on his way. Third thing he noticed, Mr. Barker noticed, was a bee. Just a little bee. The bee would settle on a flower, and it would stay on that flower. It would sink itself deep into that flower and extract everything it could from that flower. The bee came in empty and went out full. As you hear God's word week after week after week after week, what is the diligent preparation in your mind? Do I want to be a butterfly just settling on one sermon after the next sermon after the next sermon? Oh, that was a good sermon. And you go, that is the next sermon. Oh, that is a, and you're settling from one to the next to the next to the next, but gaining really nothing from it. Oh, are you like the botanist who's taking notes like you are doing this morning, but you stick the notes under your arm and you go on your way and they mean nothing? Oh, are you like the bee who will settle on that word? He would settle on Ephesians chapter 6. And he would sink deep into Ephesians chapter 6. And you would draw everything out of Ephesians chapter 6. That you came into Ephesians chapter 6 empty. And you're going out of Ephesians chapter 6 this morning full. Which one are you this morning? I pray you would be the bee. The author of one of my best books in my library called The Reformed Pastor. is a man called Richard Baxter. And Baxter, apart from the Bible, is the only man who makes me cry when I read. He makes me cry because he shows how far I am from pleasing God. And Richard Baxter, in his book concerning me, he calls it the Reformed Pastor. He writes the following concerning all of us and how we come to a sermon on the Lord's Day. He says this, and I want to quote this. Some of us desire to merely know for the sake of knowing. And he says that is a shameful curiosity. Some desire to know that they may sell their knowledge. And we find that even in prosperity gospel preachers where they're selling their knowledge, selling their tapes and whatever for, for profit. He says some desire to, to, to know that they may sell their knowledge and that too is shameful. Some desire to know for reputation's sake. And that is shameful vanity. In other words, for reputation's sake, I'm a Christian. Oh, I, I, I desire to know this, but only because I'm a Christian. But there are some who desire to know that they may edify others. And he says, that is praiseworthy. But then he says, and there are some who desire to know that they may stay themselves, may be edified. And he said, that is wise. So my friends, be wise today. Go deep, dig deep, that it may be good for you, that you may benefit in Jesus' name.